So anyways, if you want to know about our children's materials, we have a book coming out called Growing Up With God, and it's a, it's a novel. And alongside of the novel, it's for kids 7 to 12 years old. And we have 40 illustrations in the book, or actually close to 55 in the book. And then we have a workbook, a uh, study course for homeschool and for Sunday schools. And uh, it's just beautifully done. It's absolutely gorgeous. We're working on it right now, but we're doing Book Rally. Book Rally is like Kickstarter, so it's crowdfunding. There it is, but that's black and white version. Those are my characters. I actually did that. Is that do you guys want to play it later, or do you want to try and do it now? Is that a yes? Okay, go for it. Okay, I don't have to talk about it. And then I'll get to the message. I want to introduce you to Growing Up With God. It's my new novel with characters Lucas and Maria here who are on an everyday adventure of hearing God's voice. You know, there's some stories that are the big epic battles of good versus evil, but I wanted to teach kids like in everyday situations how to hear from God and how to make brilliant choices out of their identity and who God is inside of them. And look at her, she's so cute. I love her little, her little detail right there. Isn't that cute? And her big, her big red hair. So one of my favorite things to do that a lot of people would know who, who know me is I love to write creative stories. And I love the coming of age stories. And one of the things that I wrote into this story is the spiritual coming of age, where kids seven to 12 years old are starting to hear from God in powerful ways that really shape and form their identity. And in this book, there's a lot of takeaways kids are gonna get everything from how to not compete, but actually go on a journey where you support everybody else and believe in everybody else the same as you wanna be believed in. There's lessons like, how do you like grow in compassion and actually impact the world around you with compassion? Lucas, he's our, He's our stud, he loves soccer. He has the big blue eyes. I mean, who's cooler than Lucas? And he's almost as tall as me. <laughs> so there's some really profound stories, but it's done in such a way that you just fall in love with Lucas and Maria and their process. And sometimes they don't make all the best decisions right away. And sometimes they're tempted to make the worst decision. But as they walk with God in the story, you see how as they keep choosing God, how it plays out for them and how God works all these things for their good. So we're using an illustrator named Lamont Hunt, who's a good friend of ours, and he's worked on major motion pictures and illustration before in the past. And he's doing this book for us right now, and he's just so alive. Like he has such a deep personal faith and a deep personal connection to these characters and to the story. There's 60 images that he's drawing and he's doing both computerized, but we also want to do a coloring book out of this. And so he's also doing the black and whites. We're very excited about his art style because I feel like it's a mixture between almost like an anime and like a Disney Pixar. I, I love the mixture of how he's doing the art and how it comes alive. This story brings up all kinds of everyday real scenarios, but how we can respond as Christians. And it's not like edutainment, it's actually a very alive story. So we're using Book Rally, which is a crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, phenomenon that's just come on the internet. It's kind of like Kickstarter, but it's just for publishing. And this is a huge risk for us because we're using illustration. We're using children's stories in a way that we never have before. I'm not in the children's market currently. I've been a best-selling author in adult books and teaching books, but we're doing a children's book and we're doing it with illustrations. And so we need your help to get this book in the form it needs to be in, to get a hardback book. So we wanna invite you to stand with us and join early and help us to bring this book to the mass market. I believe that Christians everywhere need a tool like this. And kids are not only gonna be inspired, it's just a great story, but they're gonna be able to read it again and again and get different things out of it, whether it's about hearing God's voice and prophesying to others, whether it's about taking radical risks for kids who are being bullied or kids who are underprivileged. So you may not have ever funded a project like this before. Maybe you have kids, maybe you don't have kids. I wanna encourage you for kids right now who are alive, who are some of the most powerful individuals who God has ever made before, they need a tool like this. So I wanna thank you for even thinking about or considering partnering with us. Thanks guys. Thank you for playing that. One of the things I wanted to make sure to do uh, in that story is to have not just the white kid with blue eyes, but have every race and culture represented. So we have African American, we have an Asian, we have, you know, so we went for it. Uh, <laughs> they kept that part. Uh, my video editor had fun with some of that stuff. So, but um, I think this is important. One of the reasons why we are doing this, and I'll just say this as a prophetic word that I'm gonna move right into teaching, is that this generation who's alive right now, there's never been a generation of children who's as empowered as this generation. If you ask the average, there was a poll that was just taken, 
uh, by a college, UCLA, that they polled kids between, I think it was six and nine or six and eight. Do you believe that world hunger will be healed in your generation? And 100% said yes. And just the previous generation wouldn't have had a clue. I mean, even right now in America, one out of every five or six children is going hungry at night. So even in America, we have a hunger problem or a food shortage problem or a distribution problem. So it's just interesting that this generation believes in such lofty goals, such huge things, and they're inherently full of faith for world issues to change. And so we wanted to sow into that because the average age of someone who gets saved right now in our generation is 12. Isn't that wild? Half the world's population is under 16. The average age in an American church is 42. So we have a big, huge division between who's alive and who comes to church. And we need programs and we need materials and we need you know, all kinds of things that help draw in children and actually invest in the children the same kind of budget that we invest into everybody else. So uh, just a thought, so that's what we're doing in our ministry is we're going after children because that's who's alive right now. And we believe to sow in that generation. Okay, so let's go right into um, the session. And excuse me, I'm, I have a little bit of a cold, so if I cough a little bit or whatever, um, just ignore me, I'm fine. I've had malaria, I've almost died of parasites, a cold is nothing, it's not a big deal. And uh, uh, we go all over the world, I have for 24 years now, and we go to the extreme poor, like our team goes extreme poor, red light districts, war zones, but we also meet with world leaders and go to Hollywood and do all kinds of other stuff. Like in the last couple of years, I felt schizophrenic because I was like at the Avengers premiere with some of our friends who were in the, in, in, acting in it, and then I was like the next week, I was somewhere like in... Um, Oh, no, it was a couple months before I was in somewhere like in Mexico, like in the middle of like a slum. And so I just, it's such a schizophrenic life. And I like the entertainment missionary side a little bit better because there's a little bit more comfort in it. It's like sometimes I, I went to the NBA All-Star game. I was like, I'm suffering for Jesus, woo, in Toronto, you know. But then I'll go with Heidi Baker to Mozambique or whatever. So it's just, I, it's a very extreme life. And what I love is that the, the, the central theme, I believe, in the next revival is the love of God. It's always a central theme because it's who God is. But prophecy helps to prove that nature the quickest and help to ground people in being present with God the fastest. So prophecy is gonna be one of the central tools of the next revival. And already with revival activity around the world right now, prophecy is just popping up. As a matter of fact, right after Azusa Now, how many of you went to Azusa Now? A lot of you here, wasn't that fun? That was an incredible day, it rained. It got crazy out, you know, that kind of stuff, but it was just an incredible day. Right after Azusa Now, there was a, ver uh, a revival that started breaking out in Virginia. Do you guys, have you guys heard about this revival where thousands of high school students are now, and junior high students are now saved, and, and also their parents. So there's thousands, I think they're up to 7,000 now salvations since April. That's a historic revival already in America. Azusa, the original Azusa took years before they started to have those numbers. And so this is a historic revival that's happening overnight. They're meeting on high school campuses, on the football fields, in different places. And one of the leaders contacted me just a few weeks ago and said, hey, one of the girls had, she had just got saved. She was 17 years old, just got saved, read your book, Translating God, and started to prophesy in one of the restaurants we were at over some of the restaurant workers, and they got saved. And so now our whole team, this is the people who are leading the Virginia Revival, 70 of us are going through, they're like right now, as of today, they'd be probably seven weeks then they're going through the Translating God book because they're trying to hear from God in a way that impacts your generation, knowing that it's the biggest tool because you can, we love counseling and therapy and our healing, deliverance, all those kinds of ministries and even uh, life coaching. But when you get a word from God, it will bypass or it'll take the place of what would take 10 counseling sessions, five life coaching sessions, 20, you know, times of reading the scripture just by yourself. When God speaks, all of a sudden, he brings you into the present with what he originally designed you to be. And so I wanna give you faith and courage today that you can hear God's voice in very powerful ways, that this is not just a reserved gift for special people who are selected, that this is a gift that Paul even loves so much that he said, pursue love like your life depends on it and eagerly desire prophecy. Now, I grew up, you know, going after the prophetic from the time I was little, my parents would ask us. My dad was a colonel near a force engineer. My mom was a stay-at-home mother who was awesome. And they would raise us asking us, what's God showing you? And when we were making major life decisions, they included us in those decisions. Like when my dad had a transfer, you know, and they, they would usually have an option between two places. And they, we would pray as a family and ask God together. And many times one of us as kids would hear where we were supposed to go. And my parents would feel the Holy Spirit on it and we would go that place. And because they didn't believe we had a junior Holy Spirit and they knew that we weren't just making it up. 
that we're actually trying to have a connection to God. So I just was raised around the things of the Spirit. I ended up hanging out in the early 90s with a group of people called the Kansas City Prophets. And there was people who were gifted, like they were born sovereign vessels. They were born like for a generation to be the mouthpiece of God. And I would look at them and go, oh, I wish I was like that. What I didn't know is that we have full access to God through Jesus, who is God. And we have full access. And so for a while, there was like kind of an us and them thing where it's like, oh, they're so awesome and mysterious. And then there's people like us who like, you know, are just normal. And, and God has totally delivered me of sovereign vesselitis, which means that there are certain people who are born under a star. Only Jesus really was born under a star. You know, and there's certain people who are born for something so spectacular. But what Paul is so, so it gives me so much courage when he says, pursue love like your life depends on an eagerly desired prophecy. Another place in, in Corinthians where he talks to the, the Corinthian people, he says, um, not many of you were, were special when you were called or that not many of you were educated. It's 1 Corinthians 1, uh, everywhere from 10 to 27. And, and he says, God chose you the weakest things of the world, the shame that, those, that which was wise. And when I read that as a 19, 20 year old, I went, oh, I'm not that bad. <laughs> because if I'm, if I'm like not that special and I'm not supposed to be because God is special, like we're all inherently special and we have so much value because of who we are in God. But at the same time, like I was looking for something to endorse me a little bit more. Like, you know, I've, I've hung out with people who had face-to-face -face encounters with Jesus and they would tell them and you would just feel like, oh my gosh, this is so real. You can't deny it. And I'm like, I just pray and read the Bible and sometimes God talks to me, but it's never like this, oh, you know. <laughs> and so I began to contend for like the everyday Jesus, the Jesus who wants to come in our lives because he, he provoked us by saying, you'll do greater things than me. And so there's this place inside of me that said, that wasn't just for Paul and for Peter, that was for all of us. So how do I line my faith up with that? And so one of the things that I've done for years is I've gone after practically practicing prophecy and words of knowledge. Now, words of knowledge, prophecy, and words of wisdom are all three different parts of revelatory gifts. There's other revelatory gifts too, like discernment. And we'll talk about a little bit of this, but not all of this. And more of this, you can go through my book and get it. But words of uh, knowledge are words from God that are present things in people's lives or past things in people's lives that when you say them, it connects the person to know that God knows me, that God is here, that the El Shaddai, he's with me right now. Whether they're saved or not, all of a sudden you give a word of knowledge and they feel like, how did you know something that's precious about my life that makes them feel known by God? So word of knowledge is not like discernment. Sometimes discerning of spirits or discerning people's issues or discerning those things. That's not a word of knowledge. A lot of times we'll discern this person had a painful past, this person grew up in brokenness, this person's parents are divorced, this person's going through a hard time financially. That's discernment and that's a great conversation starter and we've all been given discernment as Christians, but we're not supposed to stop there. We're supposed to actually ask God questions when we get discernment because a word of knowledge is always positive and it's always something that makes someone feel so, it's not necessarily positive in nature because Jesus gave words of knowledge in John 4 it's the woman at the well, but it always has a positive connotation. And so I love that if we understand that and we go after that, what if God starts to speak to you, social security numbers of the people who worked with you? Or if he started to speak to you the most secret of their heart, of something that they've never told anybody that they wanted to be involved with? What if God starts to speak to you uh, strategies and wisdom and words of knowledge about someone's career? And this is what God wants to do. There's these huge questions in the world right now that the world's asking in education. And I mean, I know the elections are super peaceful and there's not, no drama at all. So we don't really need to know much about that. But, but the, the country, our country is asking huge questions right now from God. You know, our country is scared. The nations are scared right now. The nations are scared of Trump and Hillary. The nations are scared of their own future. You know, like, it's, it's a really wild time. And when you see God and when you hear God and when you know God, you start to have a different wisdom. It doesn't come from just a natural mindset or just the culture you surround yourself around with Fox News or a certain political CNN news or certain political perspective, but you start to get a higher wisdom. And so words of wisdom help to place people's faith in what to do in days like this. They also are revelation on what to do with other things that God's already told you or other things that are true about you. So some people might feel like, you know, they're born, they're, they're in high school, they start to decide what they're gonna be doing in college, they feel like they're made for something like the arts and a word of wisdom comes along to help them to decide to be that or to, to bring uh, practical walking out steps to what they feel inside of them from God. Sometimes it's a direct word, sometimes it's an indirect revelation of just who they are as a person and words of wisdom are beautiful. And I love prophecy 
the most, actually. Like words and all, it stressed me out to give them. Today I'm a little stressed because I have names I've never heard before because there's a lot of Asian people here and I'm not Asian. <laughs> so I'm like, Haha, I hope this is not a made up babbling word. So we'll see. But words of prophecy to me are one of the most fun things, but they take time to unfold typically because words of prophecy are what God's going to do, his intention towards our future, his intention towards bringing something about so that after it happens, we can look back and go, you were with me and you love me and you planned my life and you're for me. And the world is so hungry to know, is God with me? The world is so, the church is so hungry to know, is there really a government on Jesus' shoulders that's increasing more than the enemy's increasing right now? And prophecy proves it because it places our eyes in current scenarios with a kingdom mindset, a biblical mindset. And it's so important that we all start to understand this where it's not just this complicated issue of like, I don't know, do you hear from God? I kind of hear from God, I don't know. Or it's so confusing, like in 1 Corinthians 14 when Paul tells you know, the, the, the Corinthian church, like he said, you know, tongues are great. You guys are the king of tongues. That's awesome. But tongues are for personal edification. If somebody else comes in and hears you, they won't understand what you're saying. It's going to do nothing for anybody around you. So you need to eagerly desire prophecy because prophecy will reveal the secrets of someone's heart. It'll be laid bare and they'll feel known by God. They'll feel connected to God. Well, half of the prophetic words that are coming in all the different Pentecostal charismatic churches are like words of tongues. I mean, have you ever heard a word that you're like, that is so mysterious, the way that they're communicating it. It's like a riddle. I don't have time to figure out other people's riddles. That's what tongues and interpretation of tongues is. It's like you get a riddle, whether it's a, you know, blah, 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 it's weird language, or whether it's like, I see three unicorns dancing over your head and they're spitting up purple ink. You know, I have no ability to interpret your vision. You need to interpret your vision. Every once in a while, I'll, I'll have an interpretive gift where I'll interpret dreams and visions and stuff, but it's exhausting. My best friend is Guatemalan, and he's a dreamer, and he has dreams that will take an hour to tell you. I'm like, how long did you sleep last night? Like, and so, he, he, because he's my best friend, he has no respect for my boundaries at all. And so he'll tell me those dreams. So almost every time we get on the phone, I know if I ask him what God's doing with them, I have to hear two or three of those dreams. And I'm like, this is going to take hours. And so instead, I text him, unless I'm with him face to face, because text the dreams take shorter, even though it's like two or three. Well, he only voice dictates because he doesn't uh, write very fast in English. So he voice dictates, and I hate voicemails too. So like, it's, I, we, we just are these weird best friends because I don't like his God love language. But... <laughs> But some of his dreams have steered us more than any other revelation that steered us as a community. Like he's the, now the senior pastor of our church with his wife. And, and uh, some of those dreams are the most steering devices there are. But there's more responsibility on him to interpret what those dreams are to make them useful for us than for us to interpret them for him. And we do go into places where uh, we even send dream teams out and spiritual teams out to go to like the Burning Man Festival. And one of the teams last year uh, with Cindy McGill, who's a four-square pastor, her and her husband, or who previously were four-square pastors, they just recently uh, became non-nominational. But uh, Cindy and Tim McGill went to the porn convention in LA and opened up a booth to do spiritual readings (laughs) with Patricia King and several other people and some of our team. And I was like, I don't know if I believe in this, but okay, let's do it. You know, like, go for it, guys. We'll be praying and covering you. And they they had girls and guys coming out, mostly girls coming out, and telling them reoccurring dreams or dreams. And then they interpreted them and said, this is what God's trying to tell you through the dreams. And people got so radically touched by God because they never are around church. There's no way that they're going to be around church. And they're getting church at the porn convention. I don't know how that all, I don't understand. Don't like, don't judge me for it. It's all on Cindy, but I love her. <laughs> no, we sent some of our team, so it is on us too. But, but so I believe in the interpretation, but I also believe that as a Christian, you're responsible for interpreting as much as you can because I think that we don't want to leave people confused. And so I just want to give you kind of like a signal of some of the, or a um, signpost of some of the gifts because I'm going to tell you some stories and then kind of uh, activate your faith to go after this. But I want to I just lay a foundation that all of us hear from God. And there's several key texts of scripture 
that are proof of this. And they're not just like a one-line scripture. It's whole themes of the Bible of how God intended the Bible to be read from us. And one of them is the famous John 10, where Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. I speak to my sheep. They know my voice. Now, how many of you are saved? So we're in church, so everyone's going to raise your hand. Hopefully you all are. I love you. I'm so glad you're here if you're not. And hopefully this will be entertaining, if not anything else. So, but, but if you are saved, you've already heard God's voice because you didn't love him first. He loved you first and he called you. So if you're saved, if you're like, I have people come up to me and go, I, I'm a Christian, but I don't hear God's voice. I'm like, if you, that's an oxymoron. You can't say I'm a Christian, but I don't hear God's voice because first of all, you're saved, which means you heard his voice call you. And number two, you, do you read the Bible? Yeah, you're hearing God's voice all the time through the Bible. And it actually goes in and does things and makes you make different choices, whether you are conscious of it or not. And a lot of times as Christians, because we live in a Greek-minded culture, we forget that we're spiritual before we're mental. I, I should have said intellectual, but I like the word mental. <laughs> we're spiritual before we're intellectual. And so that means that a lot of the, the ways that God works, it bypasses our mind to go straight to our heart or our spirit. And that's very important to understand because you have to learn how to listen to his spirit and to your spirit. And we know how to listen to our conscience and our mind, but we don't always know how to listen to our spirit or God's spirit. And we have to learn that because that's part of learning how to hear from God and learning how to hear the good shepherd. Now, the second place in scripture that's really important to point this out is John 16, where Jesus is telling the disciples (laughs) that uh, he has to leave them and they're shocked. They're completely terrified when he's saying this. I mean, the last time he said anything like this, Peter's like, no, Jesus, I won't let you. You won't ever have to do this. And he says, get thee behind me, Satan. I mean, that's how adamant he was. He was like, you're threatening like my destiny, like go away, you know? Right after he says, I'm gonna build my church, or my father's gonna build his church on your name and your, on your foundation. 10 seconds later, he's like, get thee behind me, Satan. God gives me great courage when I read about the disciples. But in John 16, he tells them, I'm, you know, I, I'm gonna leave with you though when I go, the Holy Spirit who will speak to you things that are directly from the Father. So basically, he's already told them you're gonna do greater things than me, but then he tells them why, because they have the access point the same way he had the Holy Spirit, they're gonna have the Holy Spirit. And then Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 2, where he says the Holy Spirit searches the deepest parts of the mind of God, and he reveals them to your spirit and your mind. And he even goes so far as to say, you have the mind of Christ, which means we have a different processor than our own mind. We're not just processing with a human mind that can articulate spiritual things. We actually have a higher processor level than normal Joes have because we've been given a mind that thinks things that we shouldn't even be able to think. I mean, when you meet Christians in third world countries who are in the slums who are, or who are in like terrible war zones, it's amazing how hopeful they are. Like I'm embarrassed sometimes when I meet people. I remember one of the first mission trips I went on to South America, we went to the Amazon where no white people had ever been or Asian people or whatever, only other Hispanic people and Indian and indigenous people had been. And so we went there because I just wanted to go somewhere where no I, that was untouched. I thought that'd be fun. And uh, so I asked where we can go and they told us. So we were just showed up. Like there's no like call and say, can we do a conference? So it was like, you know, you just show up and hopefully God will show up. And when we got there, I was like, okay, God, this is going to be bizarre. And there was one Christian who came from there who ended up leaving the tribal life and get, going through college. So he went with us because he heard about us and he went with us. I remember looking at him and he was so full of God and so full of hope. When we got to the, vi- the first village and he was from a village a little further in, when we got to the first village, everyone was so depressed and so like opposite of him. I'm like, how could you have come through this window. Like, this is just not, how is this your people? You're so different, but it's the life of Christ. And it was beautiful. We had incredible encounters with God and God showed up and he interpreted and helped us. And we had a a number of salvations and healings and it was a beautiful time. And I got a parasite that lasted years. (laughs) Beautiful. And, (laughs) you know, the price of going to places where we have never been before, you know, And, but I remember just watching the difference between him who had had a life in God now for, I think over six or seven years and the people we were going to, which were his people who had no life in God. And he had like this higher mind. It wasn't just that he was educated. His mind was enlightened. He was only six years away from being who he was with when he was with them. And he was like light years ahead. 
I remember just going, wow, God, your life makes so much difference in all of us because we can think at a different capacity. It's like we have an enlarged capacity to carry issues, to think about the world around us. I have several family members who aren't saved who if you start to talk about the bombings that are going on right now, they just shut down. I can't talk about it, it's too traumatic. I hate it too, but I know that my Jesus looks at every act of injustice and can see it without losing his attitude and his mood and, his, and who he is because he has a bigger p- picture. In his mind, he sees everything and he knows the end from the beginning. So he's still in sorrow over what's happening, but it doesn't change the state of being over what's happening. Now, I, my state of being changes all the time. I'm an emotional creature. I get really sad. I was reading some stuff on the way here even, just in the news. I hadn't read the news in the last couple of days. And I was reading and just, I was just so sad over just the state of the world right now, but I also am so hopeful because John 16, I have the Holy Spirit relating to me what God's plan is. God's plans are always good, and prophecy should always speak of the good plans. And there's a war right now. If you hear the word prophecy or prophetic and you're not used to it, those of you who are used to it, there's a war right now between those who are using it to, you know, bring conspiracy and those who are using it to bring love and life. And there's people who make a lot of money from from having a word about things that brings you into conspiracy, There's a lot of people who write whole books on the Nephilim agenda. If you don't know what that is, it's based on a little book of the Bible called, or anti, not anti-biblical, extra-biblical book called the Book of Enoch that was not canonized in the Protestant scriptures. And there was one reference to Nephilim, which would be the fallen uh, men with the fallen uh, it doesn't even really matter, but I'm just, I'm just using this as an example. The, fallen, the sons of God who were fallen angels who slept with women right before the days of Noah the flood, and they supposedly had these babies, and these babies, when they would die, like once they became full-grown men, they were so evil when they would die, they became demonic spirits called Nephilim, something like that. And there's people who are making money right now, energizing us so that we would look at Illuminati and Nephilim and care more about that than we care about the people who they're calling Nephilim and the people they're calling the Illuminati. And so there's this conspiracy-based thing where Christians love to be in the know of supernatural things. And if you add conspiracy to our faith, it actually derails you from God's people, from the very object of his affection. God is a lover and he cares about humanity. And yes, there's demonic agendas out there, but there's a God agenda. That trumps all demonic agendas. I can walk into a place and be completely naive and be completely safe because of God if he calls me. And there's so many people who will teach you how to be careful of the ley lines you're on and where you're at and what's going on and those principalities and blah, blah, blah. And it's this charismatic witchcraft, basically, that actually wars against love. And I say that because as we're pursuing the prophetic together, and I'm not saying that there's not discernment of spirits and that there's not times to know things, but there's when you're empowered by the knowledge of the dark things you know versus empowered because God has given you favor to love well and you have connection because of favor, not because of what you know, you're in trouble. So I say that just to lay a foundation that the good news is I don't have to have secret mysterious knowledge over the Knights of Templar or whatever, (laughs) whatever the theme is. Or if I go into certain nations, they'll tell me all about, did you know about the blue people? I'm like in Thailand, what are the blue people? There's these people who've been given over to the demons and they'll tell you the whole stories and it's all superstition and da, 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 da. Do you ever see demons, Sean? And it's this weird thing where we want to know what the enemy is doing. And that's okay, but we have to want to know what God's doing more. And so I just lay that as a foundation that God has good news. He's in a good mood. He has great things to say. He loves each person who's alive today. Even if Hitler was alive today, God would be pursuing him with his love until the day he died and did. You know, and I remember one of our missionaries, she was, it was when we first felt called to war zone. She actually was the one who led the charge. She said, God has told me my missionary grace is for war zones and red light districts. And I'm like, she's 22 at the time, white, beautiful single girl. And I'm like, I'm not gonna send you to war zones and red light districts as a missionary. Like, that's like crazy. You're 22, you're bit, no, you're, but she'd heard from God before. And so our team, when we were praying for her, we were like, we have to send her because she hears from God for real. And she started to get so much fruit, especially in Congo in the war zone. And I remember she came back at one point and she had hit a wall and it was a political wall, but it was also a spiritual wall. And she didn't know what to do. And so she came home and some of the intercessors were like, well, it's a principality of blah, 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 you know. And she was praying and all that was distracting to her. It wasn't helping her. It wasn't good discernment. It was just discernment, you know? It was a conversation starter that had no finish. So they should have come to her with more than that, but they came with just the strategy of the enemy versus the strategy of heaven. So she's asking God, God, what do I do to 
to get past this. And God said, if Hitler was alive right now and I wanted, you to send it, I wanted to send you to him to love him and bring him the kingdom, regardless of what he did, would you be able to go? And she said, no, that would be really hard. Like, I don't know if I can go to Hitler. And, he said, and God said, I want to send you to some warlords and dictate, uh, and some warlords and rebel soldiers in Congo that will be your breakthrough, but you have to see them with my value over them. That they have leadership in the, these dark ways because they're called by my heart to lead. And they, it's been prostituted by the enemy. And so I need you to love and believe that warlords can be redeemed and that I can send you to them. And if you don't believe that, I can't send you. So she came and told us that. And I'm like going, you are a pretty little Canadian girl who's single, who wants to go into the war zone, be dropped in by the United Nations so you can do assessments so you can secretly meet warlords to bring them to Jesus. Do I look crazy? And somehow, because of some of the steps she'd taken and how faithful she'd been and how faithful God was to her, we released her to go and she brought a, a company of warlords and rebel soldiers to the Lord. Radical story. And I remember just thinking, yeah, it's just awesome. Now we have uh, two schools through her organization. It's called Justice Rising. We helped her launch it. Um, two schools right on the border of the war zone for kids who can't, they're in IDP camps and they have nowhere else to go. And they're being educated in a really professional way. And also there's some rebel soldiers being um, deprogrammed right now in the schools. And there's over a thousand kids now, which is just amazing. So if you want to look at justicerising.org, you can. And you can hear the conti continuing story. But what I love is that uh, in this process, she challenged us and she came back and was like, she's telling us the story of this one warlord and she's telling us all kinds of stuff that I couldn't even tell you. And I mean, my heart is sickened by hearing the reports of who these people are. And she has rose-colored glasses. Like, and then God told us, and this is what's happening. I mean, even these two guys, the way that she re-ran into the warlords because she didn't know how to get there was some guys were trying to hold them up for bribes on a certain road that they went on and then they realized that it was who they call Sandra Cassandra Sandra and they're like are you Sandra and she's like yeah and they're like oh come with us our leader wants to meet with you again this is awesome that you're here they were trying to rob her possibly do more and then they gave up on the robbing because she had led her leaders to the Lord and they're like we're all Christians now trying to rob her but we we need someone to teach us the Bible because we can't read so we need someone to come teach us the Bible and so she's like, okay. So she goes and they have no discipleship, but they become believers. So, I mean, I'm, I'm hearing some of the bad stories. Though. Those are the fun stories. I'm hearing some of the bad stories and going, Lord, I don't know that I'd want to meet with a dictator or with a, you know, child soldier who's now a rapist or whatever, you know, like I don't, or a warlord. I don't know if I'd want to meet with them. I don't know that I have faith that me personally, that your love could come through me for them. And this is what I love about encountering God's love and hearing his voice is that he gives you a context to love in places that aren't even, that are completely foreign to you, that aren't even relatable to you. The prophetic's not just a gift. It's a way to relate through the spirit of God to his very love nature and who he is. And there is gifts of prophecy, but the gifts of prophecy, when they're plugged into his love nature, where it's relational with God, it's not just like somebody who's, there's lots of people who are out there singing and doing music, but there's some people who are doing music. There's some people who are so connected to what they're doing in their gift because they're connected here and here that they're changing the world. And so we have to connect beyond the gifts of prophecy, words of knowledge, words of wisdom. And we have to come to a place where we are like the disciples when they, when they were like hearing the first time, the Holy Spirit's gonna come on you and speak to you from the Father. He's gonna speak things that only the Father would say. What a beautiful scripture, right? I just wanna read the 1 Corinthians 2 passage real fast. Verse 10, and this is um, the NIV version. But God has revealed this to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of man except man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. We have not received a spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is why we speak, not with words taught to us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths and spiritual words. Now, this is huge because... When you know when someone's in a life in the spirit because they, they aren't just relevant to their own culture and to their own people, whether it's their church culture, or their natural culture, but they're, they're relevant wherever God wants to speak. And for me, growing up in the church, the prophetic was a really powerful tool to build apostolic movements, 
glory, fire, you know, like these kinds of things. Especially the Pentecostal church, man. The pro- prophecy is like how you get appointed. <laughs> it's how you get positioned. Thus saith the Lord, you will be the next, you know. And it's like the person's all of a sudden becomes more because someone prophesies over them. And I, I, I joke around about that, but I really do love how the prophetic is being used in the church. But there's this place in me that was saying, God, the same way that I was ordained in ministry, I was ordained in a very, uh, the first time I was ordained, I was ordained for tax reasons. I didn't know there was a spiritual process. I just thought like, I need tax break because I'm a minister. And then the second time, Bobby Connor, some of you have heard of Bobby Connor, who's a prophet from the South. Hey, that's Bobby Connor. And um, Bobby Connor came along and uh, just in connection to my life and some of our close friends. And then a man named Bob Jones, who's the prophet of prophets. Bob is an Arkansas hick who only had a third, uh, eighth grade education, who was one of the most brilliant men I ever met and who prophesied like you wouldn't believe. But most of what he said was riddles. But I mean, the reason why the call, we did a Susan Now call was because Bob was one of the main prophets that prophesied over Louis Engle that he would gather youth in stadiums to turn this nation back in the first call, you know, 13, 14 years ago. And so Bob was responsible for the school of Bethel School of Ministry, which has now 1,400 students. He was the one who prophesied and gave Bill Johnson the courage. Mike Bickle with International House of Prayer, he was the prophet that prophesied there would be night and day prayer. As a matter of fact, they just had a word this year that came true where Bob said, not only will you do night and day prayer, but workers, migrant workers in China, who are the poorest of the poor, will be watching and worshiping and praying with you night and day on their watches. This is before there was any even, this is the 80s. There was no like watch. I had a Timex. I had like a calculator watch. That was as good as it got, you know. And now this year, uh, the House of Prayer actually put, there's these like cheap little watches that can actually play video live time. So they they invested and they bought thousands of these watches for migrant workers in China. But there was already, it was already happening. And so now there's all these Chinese migrant workers that are day and night worshiping, becoming an intercession force for China. But just, I mean, those kinds of things. So Bob was, you know, like Bob's crazy, Bobby's crazy. Well, they ordained me and when they prayed for me, I was in Moravian Falls uh, with Rick Joyner's place that some of you know who Rick Joyner is. And I was in Moravian Falls and and Bobby said, I'm supposed to ordain you. Are you ordained? And I said, well, I'm ordained, but it was for tax purposes. I'd love to be ordained for real. What does that mean? You know, and they prayed over me and I received a new grace for ministry that I wasn't expecting. I mean, it was a complete new grace for ministry. I just changed, like something enlarged. I can't describe it. It was a spiritual thing. I was shocked by it because I thought ordination was for taxes and it just went boom. And I remember in that moment, I thought, because I've always been, you know, had a heart for the entertainment industry. I remember that moment saying, God, I wish my friends who were called entertainment industry could have this kind of ordination. And the Lord said, they can Like, I want to ordain people for their purpose. Like, I want to come and bring recognition and prophetic installment or spiritual installment to grace. I remember just going, this is so good, God. Like, I love how you are. Like, you actually, you come on us and you bring a capacity that's enlarged on our spirit. For me, it was for ministry ordination. For some of you, it's for business or it's for family or whatever. But but I love what the prophetic does because it recognizes what God's doing and it makes it big. It's already big in God, but it makes it big for you. <laughs> um, I was going to uh, uh, film some of the episodes for Dreams and Mysteries, the John Paul Jackson show, and I was on my way, and it was brand new for me. Still is brand new for me, but it was brand, brand new. And we were just in the beginning of talking about what would this show look like, you know, in this, in this, now that he's passed away, what, what can we do with this show? And so I was on my way there, and I took an Uber from, I was staying with some friends in Dallas, and I took an Uber um, to the location. My friends from Dallas were like, oh, we'll drive you. I'm like, no, I just want to go alone. I'll just take an Uber. And I'm new to the Uber scene, so I don't know, you know, I, I brought like half my Uber drivers to the Lord so far. And um, just because you have like 30 minutes to talk to him or more, so why not talk to him for real, you know? So so we're in the car and there's a, it's an Ethiopian guy and we're talking and I was like, oh, I've been to Ethiopia and we're talking about Ethiopian food and Ethiopian culture and we're just talking about life. And and after a while, he's like, what do you do? And I'm like, how am I going to explain for him? Because I don't want to just say ministry because that'll be like traditional liturgical, you know, ministry in his mind. So I was like, you know, I teach people how to connect to God for real as a Christian, from a Christian perspective. And he goes, oh, that's fascinating. What does that look like? And so I didn't really talk that much about it because we ended up going on something else. And I looked at him after a while. I felt the Holy Spirit on me. And I felt the Holy Spirit say, this is a good man. I could feel the father's thoughts and I felt like in their 
lives, his wife and him in their lives, that most of their family members had gotten divorced because of affairs, but this man had stayed faithful. Even they had generational affairs and generational womanizing, he had stayed faithful and he had stayed a man who was true to his word and his covenant. And then I saw him like, he had a great business and it went down in the recession in 2008. And I started to get these impressions and these feelings. So I said, hey, uh, can, I, can I have a spiritual moment with you? And he goes, yeah. And I realized he's not gonna believe me even with those things, unless God, you give me something that just calls his attention. So I asked for a word of knowledge and God said, Sephora. And I'm like, the, the makeup store? Support, I mean, my wife goes to Sephora, right? And so I'm like, or Sephora, but I'm saying Sephora. And um, see, I was wrong even this long later of what Sephora and Sephora are. Sephora is a ramen noodle restaurant. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, okay, I, I don't think this guy is into, and I thought it was makeup still even until this moment. So I said, hey, does the word Sephora mean anything to you? And he said, how do you know this name? I'm like, I didn't even know it was a name. So like, that's awesome. What does it mean? He goes, that's my wife's name. How do you know my wife's name? And he's both excited and frustrated, you know? <laughs> and I said, God just showed me your wife's name because he knows you and he knows your wife and he knows your marriage relationship. He knows how hard it's been and how you've been faithful and she's been faithful. And I start, and he has to pull over because he starts weeping. I'm like, okay, the Uber driver's weeping. I was in the back seat because he had stuff on the front so I didn't sit there. I'm like, so we're sitting there for a long, awkward silence. I'm like, I have nothing else. You know, I told him what I told him. And then he goes, God is real. God is good. I'm Catholic. And I said, well, you're more than Catholic today. You're God's friend. Like, let's take religious titles off. You're God's friend. I said, do you want to know him this way? And he's like, yeah. So I love him to the Lord. So as I was leaving him, I was, got to the offices and where they had the studio. And I'm hugging him and I gave him some extra money because I just wanted to bless him. And, and, um, and he's hugging me and he's just beaming, freaking out. He gave me his card and he was so excited. You know, he's beaming. And the producer comes out and he's like, wait, because he'd been waiting for me. And he, he goes, why didn't we have the cameras on right then? I'm like, I don't want to prostitute what just happened. It was just so awesome. I, don't wanna, I didn't want cameras on that. But it was like such a beautiful moment where I just was like, God, only you can take an everyday occurrence of just us taking a ride somewhere and turn it into a life-changing eternal moment. Now, prophecy does this faster than anything else. I don't mind tracks. I, I'm not a track giver, but I've met people who've been saved through tracks. I used to be like, in my old zealous and mature days, I'd be like, I hate tracks. I hate Christian TV. I hate blah, blah, blah. But now I know God wants to use all kinds of stuff. And whatever's relevant to your heart culture and whatever you feel empowered in is powerful. You know, I mean, I don't like flags in churches, but a lot of people do flags in churches. I've been hit in the head like three times. I'm tall. <laughs> It's not that I don't like the flags themselves, but I don't trust the women or men who are wielding them. <laughs> Nor do I like the worship expression. It doesn't like appeal to my heart. I, I'm not into like um, parades and that comes from pageantry and March for Jesus. And that's where all most of the flag, flagging came from in the church is through the March for Jesus movement. And I'm just not into that. Like I love professional dance and I come from a musical theater background and I love modern dance and eclectic dance and hip hop and crunk and all. And so like when I see like just pageantry in the church, it scares me. And, you know, just kind of kidding. But I'm like, you know, I'm like, oh, can we have something else too? Because a lot of churches I go to love one style. But in my maturity, I can say, I hate flagging, so therefore flag flagging is irrelevant. But when you start to hear from God, you realize he wants to use the things that are important to you regardless of their inherent value. And so it, you don't have to be special and you don't have to change a whole bunch for God to use you in the prophetic. You can be exactly who you are and you will evolve and you will like look back at stages you went through and went, oh my gosh, God, you used me even when I was there. And even when I thought that, and even when I was involved with that, you still use me. Even when I thought that was the most powerful thing in the world, you use that as a window of faith to develop me here. And that's a beautiful thing. So I just say that because some of you are like, you know, you've written off some things that God wants to use even through you. And God, usually when you say, I hate something, God will test you with it, so be careful. All the things I said I didn't want to do. I'll never write a book on finances. Keys, Evans, economy. I'll never write a book on dating. I'm religious guy to dating. I'll never be on Christian television. I'm on all the time. Like, so, God bless me to never say I will never again. Now, I try and do reverse psychology on God. I'm like, I will never be a billionaire. Um, next session, I'm going to tell you some of the semantics of uh, the prophetic, but I want to just tell you a few stories that are going to help ground your faith. Um, first of all, how many of you read the Bible for life application? 
meaning you apply it to your life. How many of you read the Bible? So you have a personal relationship when you read the Bible. So the only way that that's applicable or can happen is if you hear God. You're hearing God through the word on how to apply it to your life. Joyce Meyer is one of the most prophetic people I've ever met. I actually haven't met her, but that I've ever seen. Because she, um, she brings life application in the most profound ways. Sometimes we want prophetic words that'll be like, I wanna know who the president is, but the, actually the more powerful word for you would be how to just do life. I wanna know how to make good decisions. I wanna know how to be the best version of me. And so one of the ways that the prophetic comes that's the most beautiful way is relationally God comes to you and teaches you how to apply the word to your life. We have to look at those things as prophetic because you graduate from where you're already at. So some of you are like, when I want to be a powerful prophet, you don't get to become a powerful prophet until you're powerful and empowered here. And you understand how God is already speaking to you. For me, God speaks to me in really you know, unique ways for me. For you, he speaks to me in really unique ways for you. But there's similarities that we have in common that almost all believers, the number one way God speaks to them is through impressions. And impressions is when you get a digital download in your spirit. It's when all of a sudden you have a thought that wasn't yours, that doesn't come through your mind, that doesn't come through the frame of how you were thinking about. Have you ever, you know, you're sitting in a store in line and all of a sudden you're like, I need to talk to that person. And you're like, no, I don't want to talk to that person. I'm tired. I don't have any desire to talk to that person. That's when you know it's God. Or I need to buy something for somebody or I need to give extra money at church. I promise you that's the Holy Spirit because you are too stingy in your own nature to go, you know. I've had friends who are like, I'm learning how to give right now and I just don't know when it's God or not. I'm like, every time you feel to give, it's God because you don't want to. Because <laughs> every time we give, there's a little bit of grief in it. Like, ah, I could have bought, I could have done, I could have, you know. So like we learn, we have to learn how God speaks to us now and how, how our nature is different than his and how sometimes he'll speak something that expands our nature so that we can have those moments. And if we don't have those moments in ourselves and we're expecting to have these incredible prophecy moments with the world around us, it's hard because it takes a measure of surrender. Some of the surrender is surrendering your disbelief or your unbelief. And I'm the king of that. I'm the king of unbelief. Some of my friends who are, I have revivalist friends, especially my Pentecostal friends who call me up. Someone was raised from the dead last night at the meeting. I'm like, oh, that's great. Like, you don't believe me. I'm like, what kind of, did you tell me the story? I need them to tell me the story so I can believe them. Like the first time I've been around Heidi Baker for, for a long time, since 2003 or 2002. And Heidi Baker's like a spiritual mom. If you don't know who she is, that her and her husband lead the fastest growing church uh, missions movement in the world. They have 38,000 bases now because of what they're building and it's growing. So Heidi, um, Heidi would tell me about some of the pastors and, and especially in Mozambique and Malawi and some different places and they would you know, have dead raisings. Like some, one of the guys, Sapraza had a guy after three days of completely dead, verified by doctors, they brought him to a meeting that Sapraza was at and he prayed for him and he had his eyes like sealed shut from this glue. They do this weird process and he came alive again. So I was like, oh, that's a neat story. <laughs> I needed to meet Sapraza and the young man. I just couldn't at face value, like, because there's just too much, like, there's too much stuff that's, this happened and this happened and this happened that's like, you know, we should have more verified miracles by doctors. And so I just wanted to be around it a little bit more. I remember meeting him and I'm meeting the young man. I'm like, okay, I repent. <laughs> So I'm the king of unbelief. As a matter of fact, when God starts to speak to me this way, I'm like, I don't know that I believe this is you. Like when I start to hear words and knowledge, I don't know if I believe this is you, I'm so sorry. He said, test me, try it out. So some of you are gonna have to get over your, and suspend your disbelief by choosing to go after something that wouldn't be normal for your nature to even believe in, or even, in the, even you might be, belong to this church, and so this church believes in the miracle power of God, but at the same time, you might be struggling in the pew here, in the church here, in the seat, you might be struggling going, yeah, I kind of believe what we've said and what we've seen. I mean, I had a friend who was in our church his whole life, saw people healed all the time, but he didn't believe in one of the healings. And then one day he needed a healing in his family and they were healed. And it was the first time he believed it. But he, he'd been tithing, biblical believing his whole life, but just had not been able to suspend his disbelief over the miraculous. And Mark 9 is a beautiful scripture because and it'll help you with your unbelief because a man comes up to Jesus and says, Jesus, my son is throwing himself in the fire, trying to kill himself, trying to drown himself in water. He's so demonized. Can you do anything about it? Now this man, Jesus had seen him. He'd been hanging out. 
He had been watching the miracles. He knew that this man knew he could do it. He wouldn't be coming up to him and asking him if he didn't believe he could do it. So he says, wait a minute. You are speaking out of such a place of unbelief. When are you ever going to believe? And he goes, oh, I'm so sorry. Heal my unbelief. You can do all things. So he spoke what he knew was true. You can do all things if you really are the son of God and heal my unbelief. And that was enough. He said, go, your son's healed. He didn't have to do like, oh, boom. He just said, your son's healed. It was done. And so some of us in here, you have massive unbelief when it comes to yourself hearing from God or other people hearing from God or you've heard the negative stories of where people have been manipulative and so (laughs) you're like, well, you know, they get a little earpiece in their ear and that's how they get those words because one guy did it in the 70s. So you're like, I know that that's how it happens now versus going, what if God does and does through you? Because the whole world's hungry for something. They're hungry for what does God look like? And it's very important that we start to answer this. Now, just the last part of this, I wanna profess over a few of you just to give you faith. And the next session, we'll go into some more of the, um, I'm kind of building theology and philosophy with you, so you'll have a hunger for this. But in 1 Corinthians 14, when it was talking about prophetic words, there has to be this place of agreement in you of what the words are for. And I'm just gonna read down a list of some of the things that we're believing for with prophecy that we're called to disciple nations. And I was involved with the Transformation uh, Sentinel group for a little bit, which is the group that put out the Transformation videos. And I watched and people like John Melinda in Uganda and people all over the world who were discipling their nation, who were speaking into the top level advisors. I have spoken into Korea. I was a spiritual advisor for one of the presidents of Korea. I also have done spiritual advising for two of the past presidents of the 1980s of Korea. One of them was a a dictator, the most notorious uh, Korean president in history. And I brought all of his children to the Lord except for one. And I still speak into their family, including the mother. So I know what it's like to speak into national leaders. That's that's one of the nations that I've seen that happen in. But we're believing we're called to disciple nations and the nation's leaders. Speaking in their lives to where their minds and their hearts and their lives changed. The prophetic gives you access to people because the richest people in the world and the poorest people in the world are all hungry for revelation. They're all hungry to know what God knows. And so I've been with um, dozens of billionaires and I've been with thousands of the poorest people on the earth in India and Africa and South America. Um, we're gonna go to decide, uh, we're gonna um, steer the great wealth transfer. Now right now in the top 100 billionaires, 40 of them are believers. And the top 100 billionaires have more money than America, if you combine their wealth. 40 of them are Christians. I've met with several of them. They have financial wounds towards the church. Some of them don't believe in local church because they believe local church isn't doing that much. And they've seen, like, you know, one of them, he's bought every hospital in one country and changed the whole education system. The church doesn't even put their money behind that kind of stuff. They're so preoccupied with building themselves. Sometimes this is judgment. So like having meetings with them and building relationship to them is like there's such a financial wound that they're like, why would I give to a charitable organization that does nothing for the world around it? So there's massive judgment towards those who are Christians who are holding the wealth. In America, 70% of America is, is considering itself evangelical Christian right now. I don't know how that works. It's not a very evangelical country right now. But 70% of America claims to be evangelical Christian or, or Catholic Christian. And so if you have 70%, that, and out of that 70%, we're the richest people group in the entire world, that 70%. And yet we have no unity. So what I love about the prophetic is that it brings about central points of God's heart that can bring about unity and great effect, great change. It can bring about where we've had these divisions. All of a sudden you hear a word from God about what he wants to do. We've seen this in the anti-human trafficking movement, groups that would have never worked together in the church. All of a sudden they're like, wait, what? we're doing that too. You have that revelation too. You have that love too. And they jump on board. Social justice causes happen or bring that together all the time, which I love. But there's other causes that will bring about a great wealth transfer because for a billion souls to get saved or if we have a huge revival that's imminent, or that's coming, we have to have great resources to disciple, to educate, and to make a beautiful bride for Jesus to return to. Because he's not coming back for a broken down bride. He's coming back for a beautiful one. And so there has to be, the prophetic helps bring about and steer a great wealth transfer. It it also um, 
we're gonna influence the leadership level of all industries. We may not be the leadership level, but we're gonna, enter, we're gonna influence, and the prophetic cause is a place of influence. I am connected to people like Lance Walnow. How many of you know who Lance Walnow is? And Lance, Lance and I have done some events together. One of the events together we did one time in Colorado, um, everybody else who spoke at the event, it was like very uh, conservative evangelical, and everyone else who spoke flew in on their private planes. And then Lance and I didn't even fly business class at that particular event because we we're like two hours away, so we just flew real fast, coach over there. And we, we, they were all at their private airport and coming in to eat lunch. And I think we actually ate lunch at the private airport. And I'm like going, wait a minute, we're like the keynote speakers. They're just like panelists. Why aren't we on a private plane? What's going on? But uh, I remember just being around some of these men, hearing the corporations that they represented and what they owned and what they were involved in and what they were involved in their nations. I sat down with one man from Indonesia. Why I was with him, the president of Malaysia, he's a, just a wealthy businessman. The president of Malaysia called him for advice. The president of uh, Vietnam called him for advice. And one of the lead ambassadors from America called him. Why I was sitting with him in just two hours. He's like, I'm so sorry. I normally wouldn't take a call while I'm meeting with you, but I think I have to take this call because it's the president of Malaysia. And I'm like... Yeah, no problem. <laughs> he can veto me anytime, you know. But this is a Christian who had that place of influence where they're calling up, asking for advice from a father. And they're not even Christians. So this is that place where God's gonna give us influence over leaders. Uh, we're gonna bring social justice re resolution and, and civil rights justice resolution. We're called to bring uh, resolution points. I love like, you know, we have the whole world story over the black white issue right now is very dark in America right now. It's like there's no resolution for that. And then you have Christian leaders like Will Ford from Dallas, Texas, who just got the mantle from the Martin Luther King family. They gave him two mantles of Martin Luther Kings and said, you're gonna be like one of the next civil rights justice voices. And his voice is a redeeming voice. It's a redeemable voice. Then you have Sean Smith, an evangelist here in California, who his dad was killed by corrupt police officers. And instead of it forming bitterness in him, it actually gave him the message that he now is a Christian walks in where he's led thousands and thousands of people to the Lord, especially in the African-American community, and brought them into a place of hope and redemption. So there's another story that Christians tell when there's these issues that unbelievers can't tell, or people who aren't in relationship with God can't tell. We're going to uh, innovate and make problems simple. Now, I love this because in Norway, how many of you know what the Nor national Norway symbol is? Does anybody know what it is? It's a paperclip. If you go out in front of their government building, there's a huge paperclip. I'm like, what in the heck is that? And the, I was meeting with one of the parliament members, and he said, oh, you don't know about this? And he told me the whole story. It was actually one of his you know, relatives. And so he told me the whole story about when they were in a recession, they were in a time of great financial turmoil. One of their governmental leaders cried out to God and asked God for strategy and revelation, and he got the vision of the paperclip. And it became a sustainable that and some other office products that came after it became a, a sustainer for the recession that caused them because they were literally, I, I mean, in a place of desperation. It, it was the sustainer. And through his revelation, he got more political office, he got more involved, and it became their national symbol that we can do anything. It's a paperclip. But they made a complicated issue simple. How many of you have paperclips in your house or your office? How much did that one vision affect all of us? and made a complicated thing simple. We couldn't, you know, if we didn't have a stapler, what do we do? We have to have a paper. I don't know, you know, it's just, it's, if you go to a legal office, there's like millions of piles of papers with paper clips. It's like everywhere there's paper clips and God knew he'd bring that one invention through a Christian and what would happen. And we're gonna be innovators and inventors and we're gonna be people and I'm seeing it happen. If you read uh, Bill Johnson's book on dreaming with God, he talks about some innovators and inventors. It's really beautiful. It's a beautiful prototype. And then we're gonna engineer new creativity. So we're gonna engineer new things. And I drive by the Imagineer building all the time um, on my way home from my daughter's school. And she's three years old and she's believing that God's gonna let her go there. You know, the big uh, ABC Studios and Mickey Mouse, or Disneyland Studios, or Disney, Disney Studios. And there's the big um, wizard cap. I know that sounds bad, but we love Disney. And, um, and so when we drive by, she started asking us, why is Mickey's hat there? And then she started asking us about the studios. And so we told her about Imagineers. So she prays out of her mouth, Jesus, I want to go in that building because I'm an Imagineer. I explained to her it means to innovate creativity. And I explained it in like little kid's language, but I also use the big words. The last time she said, God, I want to innovate creativity. My three-year-old. I'm like, you're powerful. 
We're gonna bring spiritual resolution to medical issues, which means we'll bring real resolution. I believe that God's gonna start giving dreams of the night to cancer research people, I, because I have a friend who had a dream of the night and has brought one issue of cancer treatment forward. There's people right now who are, you know, I remember uh, in the 90s when they started to use sound waves to break apart things like kidney stones and tumors. There's people now who are doing it on a much broader level because of revelation they got from God at the Cancer Research Institute in Seattle, where there's several Christians there who are believing for revelation to kill cancer in our generation and our lifetime. So this, this is the kind of stuff we're trying to access. I could keep going. This is the kind of stuff we're trying to access is revelation from God, not just to bring a breakthrough. Lord, we want to have a cancer-free zone. Everyone who comes in our church, let them be healed of cancer. I love that kind of stuff. That's very charismatic. It's very beautiful. But what about God's heart who hates cancer and has a strategy to destroy cancer and has actually hidden in the world the ability to obliterate cancer, which is an enemy of God in the first place? What about God's heart to innovate? And I, I just think we live in the most innovative age. Like I'm watching people walk around and do this all the time right now because they're playing Pokemon everywhere. This is probably a Pokestop. This, this church is probably a Pokestop. And people are playing Pokemon constantly and I'm just laughing in the airport. I've ran into three people because I was playing and they were playing. I'm like, oh, boom, oh, I hit you. Oh, sorry, you know. But because there's like special places to go and where you can do things. And so... But it's called augmented reality. And what happens when, when we take augmented reality where you see things on the screen or you see things through glasses as though they're really there, but it's just digital. And what happens with the medical industry when they start learning how to do surgery through augmented reality? And we start learning at a higher rate and with a higher understanding because when you learn by experience versus just knowledge, it's totally different. We're about to have a whole different generation. As a matter of fact, one of the most popular games on uh, Apple right now is a surgery game. Now it's very unrealistic, but it's a surgery game. But they measured from the time that game came out four years ago that they had a 50% jump in people choosing to be surgeons just because they were playing that game in America. That wasn't everywhere. It was just an American study. We're in a season where God cares about so much. He always has, but we're in a season where he's giving us access to his heart about it. And there's a people of faith who believe they can speak about it. There's never been a people time like this. There's never been, I mean, just think of many of you who are Asian here in America who, in this generation, you could be empowered. There's still issues. There's still racial issues. There's still issues. But I'm looking at this room and we have a predominantly Asian group and there's a lot of women here. How would you like to have been born in America in 1901? As a woman Asian, you would have been called an oriental. You would have been treated like trash. You would have been a second class citizen. You would have been somebody who wasn't, available to what you feel called in your destiny to do now, to be in the greatness of God, you would have been under a heavy oppression that could not be lifted. That took, you know, almost a century to get us this far. But now we have all these women in here who have, you know, huge call, calls of God and huge anointings, and it's still hard for women, and it's still hard for Asian women, but here you are, I'm just picking on you Asian women, here you are feeling as empowered as you do to be a voice to be a powerful person, whether it's in the church or outside the church, you feel, I can feel a lot of powerful women here. I felt it when I was coming to this church that God's gonna take the lid off of women in, this, in your church, Paul. But I feel like God's saying, and not that you put a lid on, I just feel like it's a lid that's just socially there. And I feel like we're in the stage where God is saying, I actually wanna give women power and influence the way that I originally desired, whereas Adam and Eve who were ruling and reigning. And we're, gonna, we're starting to see a manifestation in our generation, even to where Hillary Clinton's run and got this far, even with all the corruption that's going on. It's crazy. And that's not an insult to her. I'm just saying it's just crazy what happened, what's happened in this generation that in 15 years ago would have been irrelevant. And some of you would have been irrelevant 100 years ago, but God knew the generation you should be born in because of who you are. And it's a special time and we have to look at it that way because God is speaking and he's not just speaking, I hope I defined enough to you where he's not just speaking about little things. You have nice hair. God loves you and you're gonna do good on worship today. He wants to change nations. He wants to disciple culture. He wants to bring a bridge in society like no one's ever seen before. So if you're wanting to that kind of prophetic gift, I want you to raise one hand. And I dub you with the Holy Spirit 
to move in the prophetic. Anything that I have, God, I pray that you would give these ones. I pray, Lord, that they would start to see and hear in ways that astound them. Lord, that they would be so blown away by you in their own life. Thank you that we're blown away by you in other people's lives. But Lord, I pray that people who are raising their hands right now would get a deposit or an upgrade, either one, an impartation or an upgrade to what they already have, to start to move in a realm of your heart where you would start to trust us with the people groups we're called to, Lord, whether it's industries or whether whether it's uh, actual people types or whatever, I pray that you would just give us new revelation, fresh revelation as we're here, God. And I just pray that there would be something that would happen that would never be able to be undone in our life where we'd hear you in a new level. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so I'm gonna try out a couple words and we're gonna break. I hope these are real. Okay. The good thing is it's not about being right and wrong. I always have to qualify. I'll qualify a little bit more later. It's about uh, love. And so the New Testament, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but the New Testament's not about the information. It's about love. Um, I might as well just spell this out. Um, this is how, I, I can't believe I'm taking a bit, this big of a risk, but I just feel the Lord on, on this, so I'll try it. J-U-A-N-D-I. This is real. Yes. This is your name. How do you say Someone say it. Juwandi. Juwandi. Um, Juwandi. <laughs> now I feel powerful because Juwandi is here. Um, are you married? Is there, I see you. Uh, this is a funny picture, but I see you drinking a chai tea, but I think it has to do with your marriage. Is there something about C-H-I-A-I or C-H? What? Oh, last name of the future wife is chai. Jesus knows you. I just, I feel like it's significant that I'm calling you guys out first because you're engaged and God loves marriage and he loves your love and you've chosen well. And he, I just feel like he wanted to give you even more affirmation that there's resource for your marriage. There's resource. When you get married, things are going to multiply. Opportunities are going to multiply. And the Lord sees what you need to do life together and have a family. And so there's different uh, opportunities that you wouldn't have had if you never got together because both of you have different passion callings on your life that are beyond just what you would do as a career. There's ministry things, there's passions, there's people that you want to advocate for, there's things that are inside of you that the Lord cares about even more than you do. And I feel like he's just affirming you that he gave me a complete stranger to that kind of name. Like I've never heard Jwandi before and drinking a chai tea. Uh, <laughs> That the Lord is is saying that there's something that that's significant about your love, that it's not just normal marriage, but it's also calling that you have together, calling of friendship and calling of relationship that can birth purpose. And so I just bless you right now for revelation of your marriage, that God has put you together and you thank you that they recognize that God. Thank you that they found each other. Thank you for leading them, God. And we bless this even before it's marriage. We bless this relationship to come into such a deep place of intimacy and connection, God. And we pray that they would even have more. Lord, let this be a love of a century, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you guys. Wow. I had a fever yesterday and I was just praying for you guys and I got like a little download and I was like, I don't know if I'm just sick and this is... That's a really weird word, God. I don't know if that's a real word or if I'm just sick and I'm trying to. Have you ever tried to get something and it's totally not God? I've done that before. And so like, I was like, I don't think this is God. And then a lady walked by me and I got a word for it in the airport and I ran after her and I asked her and it actually worked. And I was like, maybe these are God because I almost just deleted everything because I was just so tired and I had a fever. So, so thank you, Jesus. I didn't delete Juwandi. Um... Is there an Eddie who works in like media and video? Does that make sense to somebody? Oh! <laughs> Y'all know him? Is he here? He's coming when? Next week he's coming. Well, he's on God's heart. 
So uh, well, we'll give him a word as if he's here because you all know him. So it's Eddie. Does he like to does he like to dress up like superheroes, like Superman? Is that why? Why is that funny? His last name is not Superman. Superman? Is that a real thing? How kids are? Is he here? <laughs> are you? Oh, you're watching online. Well, hello. I'll talk to you on the phone since you're here. Well. You are on God's heart, even though you're not here. And I felt like God uh, said that you're gonna um, you're gonna excel in what you're doing so much, so that He's gonna give you um, like just twice as much as what people have a normal capacity for, because of God's supernatural pe- capacity on you. But it will also start to produce a greater resource. I feel like you've been serving, but it's time to um, it's time to reap what you've been sowing for a long time, and just your servant heart. And I feel like God's saying, I have a spiritual blessing for you that's going to be monetary. So a spiritual blessing is going to be like a monetizable blessing. And, uh, and so it's not just a spiritual thing, like a nice spiritual, like, oh, I feel like I hear God more. It's a spiritual blessing where what you hear from God will pay off in great financial fruit because the Lord says he wants to make you a greater contributor to what he's doing. And he wants to make you a superman. So does that make sense? We can't hear him because of you. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, thank you. Do you feel like Superman now? Yeah, I do. <laughs> Bless you. Nice to meet you on the phone. Here you go. What a good friend just to run up and call. Superman. I'm terrible at accents. My wife, if I ever try to do an accent, my wife's like, people will think you're racist because of how bad you are. My best friend, like I told you, is Guatemalan. And if I ever try and sound like him, I sound Indian. I don't know how it happens. I'll start to sound like, not Indian, like American Indian. I start to sound like India, India. My best friend's like, how is that Hispanic? Like, you sound like you're going to ride a camel away. What are you doing, you know? That worked. I'm like all sweaty. I got all excited. And <clears throat> I'm going to try this just because that worked. Um, this would be a username, and I'm only doing this because in, my, in Nashville last night, no, the night before, I gave a username, it was a little girl, I mean, a full-grown woman's um, username when she was a little girl on AOL. And she was freaking out because everything else in the world played out. So I'm hoping this will make sense to somebody. It's K-O-K-O-I-A-N-14. K-O-K-O-I-N-14. Is that yours? Is there something about Kaz or Kazia or something? Does that make sense? That's your name. How do you say it? Keisha. Oh, it's so funny because I was thinking of my mom, Stacia. I should have just heard, listened to God on that. I saw it spelled out, though. That's crazy. Um, so that's your username for what? That's, that's awesome. God knows your username. And I think it's because I think it's, I'm getting that because, Keisha, is because God's going to use something that you're doing, like you're called to be a presence, and I feel like there's an online portion of that. Like you're called to be a voice, you're called to be seen and heard. And I feel like the Lord's saying that there's some sort of um, social media anointing of leadership you have. And uh, it's funny because we have this friend who does social media marketing and she's a Christian. She's in the top 10 of Forbes social media marketers. But she was telling us how she got there and she said, God gave me the mountain of Facebook and told me that this is your authority. And then she ended up like understanding how to do the algorithms and marketing, whatever. So now she's in the top in the world because of it. So I felt like the Lord is giving you um, a social media video presence and that he's going to anoint you for some of the things that have been in your heart all along for business online. And I feel like there's something that's inside of you that's known you are supposed to birth greatness, but I feel like the Lord's saying, I've given you the vehicle of the internet and I know you online because I've placed you online. And so there's something about this that's a a great hint to you today to give you faith for some of the projects that you have in your heart that are creative, but also have a business end to them. Does this make sense to you? Yeah. So I'm excited for you because you were, God chose you to be one of the ones who he's calling out because I feel like even the 
internet that I feel like God, there's many people here that I feel like the Lord's saying, I'm gonna expand your internet real estate. You might have natural real estate, but I'm gonna expand even for my, my sake, my calling, my name. I'm gonna expand what you're doing to be an online thing in a real way. And I feel like you're an example of that today. So bless you. Thank you so much. Wow. Okay, so those were, we'll do a lot more of that after the next session, but those were the initials and I'm so glad they were here. It gives me tons of faith. Um, you guys are like, it gives us faith too, but it gives me a lot of faith because I feel like I'm making it up as I go along and then God's here for real, which is great. So, and I'll tell you a little bit of my process prophetically too because it might help some of you, but I'm gonna ask the pastor to come back up to give us our break. Bless you guys.